This is Star Talk. Welcome back to Star Talk Radio Live from the Marine Memorial Theater in San Francisco, California, Sketch Fest 13. On stage with me, everybody's favorite, Eugene Merman. Everybody's second favorite, Dave Foley. And, and Superman favorite, Seth Shostak from the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute. I'm your guest host, Bill Nye, the science guy, sitting in for my beloved, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And you can hear the excitement in the room. Because it is the question and answer segment of tonight's program. Ladies and gentlemen, our first question comes from the back of the room, a guy in a black t-shirt with white writing. Sir. You said you're looking for a narrow band transmission, so how do you know what band to listen for? I take it that question's directed to me. <laughs> I, 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 the answer to your question is we don't know the answer to your question, right? We, we don't know what band, but I mean, you're, you're trying to second guess what part of the radio dial would ET use, it's like the bumper stickers, right? And there are certain frequencies that are better in terms of the, you know, not competing with the natural noise of the universe or because there are some natural phenomena that produce radio waves at those mm. frequencies, so those frequencies, mm. frequencies will be marked on the radio dials of ET as well as on our dial. So you, you have to guess. We cover as much of the dial as we can, but it's usually in the microwave region, if that means anything to you. So between 1,000 and 10,000 uh, megahertz. With that said, uh, Along with this fantastic gig, I am the CEO of the Planetary Society. We work to advance space science and exploration for all humankind, and we also sponsor the optical search for extraterrestrial intelligence, where we are imagining that somebody would send a light signal, and we presume generally that it would be a laser signal. And uh, it's Paul Horowitz at Harvard with his uh, brilliant grad student Curtis Mead, and they search for a light signal in uh, the same fashion, thinking that somebody out there, the same way I, of course I've grown out of it, the way I would once in a while beam my flashlight straight up, hoping to send a signal deep into space, and they would go, there's Bill with, what's that mean? Yeah, <laughs> but it is something that is, well, if, how many people have not shown a flashlight straight up? Anyone? How many people have? Yes, yes. And there's just something, that we, we're thinking that maybe that is something deep within a species and somebody else is doing the same thing. And by the way, Seth Shostak hosts his own radio show. Are we alone? No, it's, it's big picture science. Big picture science. It just got renamed. <laughs> no, I have no, given no, bad no, information. We just, the other he, way. Has, he has another radio show called Let's Talk Titties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's 24-7 yeah. Yeah. never stops source of fascination <laughs> my whole life so uh, I didn't know you were the host though. so uh, we have another question yes hey so what do you think is the deal with the jelly donut rock that the Mars rover just found do, 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 do. so I you know um uh, and my, uh, on the periphery of the Mars team, I was a little bit involved with um, all three, Spirit and Opportunity and Curiosity. This is the Opportunity rover, which was landed in 2004. <coughs> and it was supposed to, as you may know, it was supposed to last three Martian months, uh, but it's lasted 10 years. And so, woo! So, and, that's why there, and that's why there's a new Jewish holiday. <laughs> Good. You grab this crowd. Mm -hmm. So think if you had a car with a three-year warranty, this thing has lasted 40 times its warranty. So it's your car, you'd be driving a, a car like that for 120 years with no maintenance. Anyway, so last week, the rover's on a piece of uh, Martian rock, fabulous, that orange color that we all know and love, looking at pictures of uh, Mars, those of us able-bodied with color eyesight and so on, and there it is. And then a couple Martian days later, sols later, this white rock with a red middle 
shows up in the next picture of the same plate of rock. And do you know why? Nobody knows why. <laughs> and so you start talking to these guys, uh, Steve Squires, the principal investigator, Jim Bell, one of the geologists. Oh, yeah, this is like, man, this is it's just full of manganese and magnesium. We got no idea what this thing is. But to many of us, what's a rock? But, <laughs> but it's an extraordinary thing. Something happened on Mars right by this rover to produce this really noticeably different thing, not quite as big as a baseball, that tumbled into the frame. Now, it may be in the rover doing a pirouette, doing a pivot on its center almost, it chipped off something. Well, if it chipped off something, and that's what this thing is, where is the off-chip place? That is to say you would expect to find a complementary uh, socket for this, for this ball or what have you. And we haven't seen that yet. Of course, those guys were going to go looking. But it is not crazy to suggest that there was a meteorite impact a few meters away, like over the rover's shoulder. And this is, ching, a little piece, ping, poinged into, that's a verb, poinged into frame. <laughs> And wouldn't that just be extraordinary? And this uh, segues for me, personally, myself, speaking for myself, uh, it would indicate just how frequently uh, a place like Mars gets hit with meteorites. I'm not saying that's what happened, but it's not unreasonable. And it would remind us all, I hope, of the threat of asteroids. And this is something that could bring the world's population together, the only preventable natural disaster. We could go out there and give an asteroid a nudge. It's something to think about. And Seth, how many asteroids, uh, how many meteorites have amino acids? I don't know the answer to that, but uh, a lot of them do. I mean, it's very, very common. Amino acids are easy to make. Ah, you can so make them in too. your garage. <laughs> with, so with that, let's take another question. <laughs> uh, we got one over here. Man in plaid, man in plaid. So I know Nikola Tesla was mentioned earlier, and he was a proponent of the ether theory. And if that's gone away, I was wondering, how does light propagate through space? If it's a wave, how does it travel forward if it has nothing to travel through? Like, wow. That's a great question. So uh, is everybody down with the ether? Who isn't? Yeah. yeah. So because sound goes through air, waves go through water, people in the 19th century speculated that there must be something through which light propagated. And we've naturally called this the ether, naturally. And uh, then you, if there's an ether and the Earth is moving through space, one would imagine that if you did tests to measure the speed of light, say, going east and west, you would get a different answer than if you measured it going north and south because of the spin in, of the Earth and the motion of the Earth in its orbit. But you don't. Do, 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 do. And so... Just as a guy who took a lot of physics, I would say light propagates through space because it does. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and along that line, if you do tests on, you're probably hip to this sitch, if you do tests on light to get waves, you get waves, and if you do experiments on light to get particles, you get particles. And so I always say, I. I'm very skeptical that light has a problem with us not understanding it. <laughs> and so this is, uh, if, if you could figure that out, perhaps you could come up with a new physics that would, dare I say it, change the world. <laughs> but we can do these tests and reproduce these experiments easily. Light seems to travel uh, through a vacuum fine. It is the essence of energy. It is pure energy. Do we have another question? OK. I'm exhausted. Yes, where's uh, Hi. Yes. Um, I was wondering, what do you think is the worst misconception that our society has about extraterrestrial life? Seth? That, <laughs> that they need a blanket. That, that, they be, <laughs> that they be interested in uh, conducting breeding experiments with, with you, right? That's not well, your person. Seth, that's just that's, rude. With people. I, I can't see who's asking the question. It's I, all a disembodied I, I, I voice. Would, I would conduct <laughs> breeding experiments with you. <laughs> yeah. Don't they, to that, that they want Foley. to either mate with us or eat us. They want neither. Look, yeah. uh, I, you know, occasionally I get flown down to L.A. to consult with some producers, directors, writers of sci-fi films. 
And you would think that they'd be interested in the subtleties of maybe new physics or, or, or the gentleman's question about light, which is a good question. The answer is, is you know, very subtle, actually. But they're not interested in any of that. They're only interested in three things. They, the, the, the Hollywood guys, they're interested in why are the aliens here, what do they look like, and what sort of weapons do they have? Cool. And, yeah. and what day Yom Kippur is. <laughs> have to atone for something. Now, you, you, you can't say much about that, but one thing you can address, I mean, what sort of weapons do they have? You know, I always think of asking Julius Caesar, what sort of weapons do you think the legionnaires are going to have in the year 2014? And he say, oh, big spears and good... You know, <laughs> good ones, though. Yeah, good ones. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But, but the question of why are they here, right, and that's really what you're asking. I think that that is a big misconception, that the public thinks that they would come here for the water or the molybdenum or to, you know, for breeding experiments and, and so forth. Uh, none of that should interest them. They, they can find all that stuff, and it would work, uh, closer by. Okay? Uh, and the other big misconception they have is, and this is a requirement of storytelling for Hollywood. Is this getting too serious? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> that, that, they, that they're always more or less at our level that we can take them on in dogfights or, or, you know, we can triumph via courage or, or love or throw a or bucket on them of water. Yeah, yeah, or just slug them like Will Smith. I mean, <laughs> if, if aliens really came to Earth, you know, it really is Bambi meets Godzilla, and we're, we're the ungulate. <laughs> <laughs> we're the ungulate. Next question. This will be our last question. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Yeah. This will... What she means by that is, this will be the last question you ever ask. <laughs> he's, he's kidding, I think. Make it very long, <laughs> and then keep mumbling it as you walk away <laughs> to stay alive. Um, well, I know I'd heard something just sort of mentioned in passing recently that with all of the exoplanets that they've been discovering recently, they've actually revised the Drake equation. What changes did they make to it? Oh, well, the number of planets... Hey, what's the oh. Drake equation? <laughs> For there. Just to throw out... Say, as a for instance. <laughs> so... Uh, Seth, I think that you're probably the world's foremost authority, Drake-wise. No, I'm not. Frank Drake is, though. And, and, <laughs> and as it turned out, and this is true, believe it or not, yesterday I had Frank Drake explain the Drake equation while I aimed a video camera at him. This was for some uh, school kids in Australia. You actually. mean recorded him. I recorded him. <laughs> All it is you didn't is aim it like a phaser to scare him. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, Frank is totally unflappable. All of the, the Drake equation is just a very simple series of terms that makes an estimate of how many societies out there are broadcasting signals that are going right through you, your bodies as you sit through this soporific presentation tonight. Okay, so it depends on how many stars are out there and what fraction of them have planets and stuff like that. All right, it's a, it's a series of fudge terms. factors. Yeah, Eugene. well, it's not fudge. So it's, it's number of Stars Nothing. in the galaxy, number of stars that have planets, number of st those planets that would have uh, Earth-like or habitable conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an R in the month? I mean, so you multiply them all together and you get an estimate of the number of planets with, that might be communicating with us. But I dare say that the young lady who asked the question knows all that. Yes. What she wants We're helping to know is now. how do those terms change now that we found a thousand exoplanets? And the answer is not much. Because when this equation was cooked up in 1961 by a, a dozen people in Green Bank, West Virginia, right, they, they sort of bandied about what might be good values for the terms in the equation without knowing anything about planets around other stars. But they figured maybe one in ten stars had planets, or one in ten of them might have a... Well, one in ten would have planets, and all of them would have at least one planet that was habitable. So that would be one in ten stars has a planet that's habitable. The, the current number we've heard it tonight is maybe one in five. That's within a factor two for astronomy. That's really good. Not good for your taxes, but that's great for astronomy, okay? So in fact, if you look at those terms and you say, well, we know a few of them a little better, not many of them actually, but a few of them a little better, the change is very minimal. Yeah, fact, in astronomy, a factor of two. <laughs> what? Yeah. 93 million miles, 186, well, whatever. Yeah. 40 billion, 50 billion, you've heard it all. 
You guys, this has been a fabulous evening. Thank you all for coming here at the Marine Memorial Theater, San Francisco, California, Sketchfest 13. The guests have been fantastic. Dave Foley. Eugene Merman. Seth Shostak. I've been your host, Bill Nye, the science guy. Fly safely, and good night. Good night.